Welcome back, everybody. As everyone comes in, that's awesome, awesome, awesome. So welcome back to our monthly AVH study group meetings. Um, and this month, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce a man that we all know and love. And uh, Dr. Pitcairn is uh, the teacher of probably all of us. So thank you, Richard, for everything you've done. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us tonight and take it away. Okay, I'll, I'll share as much as I have. It may not be <laughs> huge amount. Well, well, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm assuming that when I switch over to my projections, uh, um, they're going to show here on the screen, aren't they? Let's Let's try it. See what happens and you can tell me you see it there yep oh yep. excellent okay so this is a kind of a um, somewhat different topic um, it's just one that kind of intrigued me I was thinking about it one time about I guess I must have been reading some of the older literature perhaps and um, <clears throat> Um, you know how the, and when you read some of, of the homeopathic literature, the first decades after Hahnemann's introduction of it, uh, they referred to themselves as a new school and the allopathic system as the old school. And, and that was, you know, obviously they were thinking because of what Hahnemann had developed and discovered that it would become the new medicine, which didn't happen, of course. But I was thinking about it, thinking, what would it have been like? What would it be like now if homeopathy were the, the dominant primary system of medicine? And um, so that's what this is. This is my thinking through it. And uh, I, I hope it interests you. Um, but it was something that kind of grabbed my mind. So I thought it'd be interesting to, to uh, share it with you. So the the uh, title here is about Hahnemann's legacy, but also is modern medicine necessary because of what Hahnemann introduced really was a revolution. So um, let's look first at the, what Hahnemann gave us. And, and I'm putting here that it is perhaps the greatest discovery in medicine because he went into it in a way that had never been done before. And he actually created a new reality for us as to how we see the patient, the nature of disease, and how to restore health using medicines. There's other ways of medicine, of course, but I mean, we're talking about using some kind of substance. This, uh, re this revolution that Hahnemann brought to us really has not been understood and accepted by our human culture, obviously. Some have. Those of you attending here have accepted and have interest in it. But even those that have embraced homeopathy have not necessarily fully understood the depth of what Hahnemann has given us. In this series, we'll go into this best we can, exploring the significance of what he has given us. So here the first, um, excuse me just a minute. The history of homeopathy um, from the beginning has had, had criticism and rejection of this method and of the principles that were introduced by Hahnemann. Um, you know, it started almost immediately. And this rejection is because the Hahnemann's discovery is not in agreement with the materialist hypothesis has been the basis. It is a basis of our contemporary medicine and science. We as a culture have embraced materialism, even though it's inadequate. And for the most part, generalizing, uh, we human beings don't really want to give it up. We like it, it's a belief system and we're unwilling to let it be questioned. This materialist assumption is a belief system. It's never been proven in the sense that um, 
that there's an objective world separate from us because the only way it could be proven would be to observe it and we can't do that if we're not here so it has never actually been proven it's assumed and it is now in contradiction with uh, other evidence which is really outstanding besides homeopathy quantum physics and psychological studies the concept of materialism is too limited for understanding reality and led, led to unsolvable problems. In spite of impressive evidence coming from homeopathic clinical work, um, rejection of the evidence that comes from homeopathic work uh, is rejected even today, of course. The most common objections are that homeopathy is not scientific because it's not based on the use of physical substance. Here's a quote from an 1882 journal about this. There are two things in homeopathy that at once antagonize the regular physician, the allopathic, the similia principle and the size of the dose administered and the feeling is so bitter that scarcely a physician could be found who will make the least investigation of it. In other words, their emotional reaction is so strong they won't even look at it. As an example, Professor Palmer in his article in the March 1882 issue of the North American Review entitled The Fallacies of Homeopathy attempts to recount for the great repugnance and general refusal of regular physicians to sustain professional relations with homeopathists. In other words, they won't even talk to them anymore. Do you sense how much emotion, even hatred, is held against homeopathy when such language is used? The funniest criticism I saw in these older journals was the accusation that make it, making a diluted homeopathy remedy was equivalent to converting water in a lake to medicine by, quote, a duck flying over the lake and farting. These reactions are typical of coming from belief, much like a religious belief in this case, that the physical world is the only reality and the source of all that happens. If we talk about factors or influences that are not physical, then we're contradicting this materialist position. And this is basically the problem. But let's look at quantum physics for a moment. A strong contradiction to this belief system, the materialist position, is the findings leading to what we call quantum physics. <clears throat> this is because the science of physics traveling the materialistic path unexpectedly found the view was not accurate. They started with that view, assuming a world made of solid matter and that the basic foundation of this matter would be little physical particles. Imagine the surprise to discover that the foundation of our physical world experience is a non-physical dimension. And the physical matter was a secondary manifestation of fields of energy. Here's a picture of Max Planck. You can see below his picture the time he lived. He was the originator of quantum physics. He was the one that made the first finding that led to further development of it. He was a German theoretical physicist. And for his work, he got the Nobel Prize in physics in 1918. Planck made many substantial contributions to theoretical physics, but his fame as a physicist rests primarily on his role as the originator of quantum theory, which revolutionized human understanding of atomic and subatomic processes. He was a physically oriented scientist. He wasn't at all expecting to find what he did. And now, because of his finding and the development of quantum physics further, it now underlies our modern technology. It's quantum physics is applied to what we're using now for this discussion, to our computers, to your phones, 
uh, the uh, different functions associated with phones and computers, all of that is based on quantum theory and formulas. This is a very interesting conclusion now from Max Planck. After he'd gone through this development of quantum physics and found what he did find, look at this quote. As a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, that is, to the study of matter, I can tell you, as a result of my research about atoms, this much. There is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particle of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of an atom together. <clears throat> we must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. The mind is the matrix of all matter. Isn't that something? Here's another one. Eugene Wigner was another major figure. He was a Hungarian theoretical physicist who also contributed to mathematical physics. He received a Nobel Prize in physics for in 1963 for, quote, his contributions to the theory of the atomic nucleus and the elementary particles, particularly through the discovery and application of fundamental symmetry principles. <clears throat> Wigner's conclusion is, quote, it will remain remarkable in whatever way our future concepts may develop that the very study of the external world led to the scientific conclusion that the content of the consciousness is the ultimate universal reality. So how can medicine ignore these tremendously important findings? I mean, this is incredible. These physicists that are very focused on understanding physical matter end up saying something like this. Well, the thing first, to put it into context for you, you should understand that medicine of today is based on Newtonian physics and has ignored the last hundred years of quantum physics development. It has ignored it. It's, used, it's still based on the idea of physical matter's primary. It's still based on the idea that Newton introduced. If we were to bring quantum physics into medicine, it would revolutionize how we understand reality, what we are and what influences us. If the most significant scientists in physics of the last century tell us that the physical world is not the primary reality, that consciousness is the foundation of our experience, how then can medicine turn against homeopathy saying it's not seeing reality properly? You see the illogic here. The flying duck responds then. How about we turn it around? What criticism can we make of the allopathic method? If Hahnemann is right, as shown by our personal experiences of casework, then might this new way of looking at it, the method of Hahnemann, be more correct, a more accurate understanding of reality? Could the old way be inadequate? What Hahnemann discovered may bring us to that view. Let us first remind ourselves of Hahnemann's advice as to what the reality of what we are. So we're going to go into, get clear before we go further, into the principles that Hahnemann introduced to us. First of all, that we are spiritual beings. In the Organon, edition six, aphorism nine, quote, in the healthy human state, the spirit-like life force, autocracy, that enlivens the material organism as a dynamis, governs without restriction and keeps all parts of the organism in admirable, harmonious, vital operation as regards both feelings and functions, so that our indwelling rational spirit can freely avail itself of this living, healthy instrument for the higher purposes of our existence. So in other words, what we are, and the way we usually think about it as a body, Hahnemann is saying is actually an instrument of an indwelling spirit. So my comment is we are spiritual beings, not physical bodies only. The physical body is an instrument brought into existence by the dynamic action 
of this spirit, the action of the life force. Spirit runs the show. <clears throat> Aphorism 10. The material organism thought of without life force is capable of no sensibility, no activity, no self-preservation. It derives all sensibility and produces its life function solely by means of the immaterial vasin, the life principle or the life force that enlivens the material organism in health and disease. Well, you asked, what is vasin? What does that mean? It's a German word. <clears throat> And in the glossary, it says <clears throat> it's a multifaceted term, which can mean any of the following essence, substance, creature, living thing, nature, or entity. There is no single English word that adequately translates basin, which is why they use it in the organon. In almost every instance in the organon, Hahnemann uses the term to refer to that entity, which is the essential, unchanging essay of something, its being. It's quintessence. A vasin is not an abstraction. It's not an idea. It is a dynamic, self-subsisting presence, even though that presence is not material and has no mass. That's very important to understand. I'll say it again. It exists on its own, even though it may not have a body as an instrument, even though it has no material or, or physical mass. So what we are, Hahnemann redefines what we're working with. Our source, our fundamental identity, is that we are non-physical spiritual beings. <clears throat> In that dimension, the dynamic organization within spirits, which he calls the basin, which is what we are as a living thing, as a living entity, has a purpose in bringing about this bodily experience. For this purpose, it brings about and maintains the physical form. Remember that the life force, quote, governs without restriction and keeps all parts of the organism in admirable, harmonious, vital operation. Then where does disease occur? Life force is what disease... Uh, what is diseased. Aphorism 11, when a person falls ill, it is inwardly only a spirit-like autonomic life force, the life principle everywhere present in the organism that is mistuned through the dynamic influence of a morbific agent inimical to life. And in Aphorism 12, he continues, it is a disease-tuned life force alone that brings forth diseases. These diseases are expressed by the disease manifestations that are perceptible to our senses, conjointly with all internal alterations. So he's saying disease is something that occurs on a non-physical level. That's the only place it occurs. It occurs there alone. And then once the life force is distorted, it now expresses what we can observe with our senses. Continuing aphorism 12, these internal and external disease manifestations express the entire morbid mistunement of the inner dynamis and bring the entire disease to the light of day. So I want to again emphasize this. He's telling us that when this disturbance happens, what our senses tell us, the internal, which are reported to us, as subjective sensations and the external signs express the entire mistunement that is a disease. They bring the entire disease to the light of day. There's nothing more we have to observe except this. So what disease is, it's not material. In the preface of the Organani says, human diseases rest on no material no accredity, that's to say, on no diseased matter. Rather, they are solely spirit-like, dynamic, mistunings of the spirit-like, enlivening, enlivening life power, <laughs> power force energy, the life principle of the human body. 
that are not based on any physical thing. In footnote 31, he says, diseases are not mechanical or chemical alterations of the material substance of the organism. They are not dependent on material disease matter. They are solely spirit-like, dynamic mistunements of life. Right here, we turn into the first conflict. The allopathic system makes no bones about it, but pun not intended. The allopathic view is that the physical material world is primary. All that we experience, including consciousness, they consider to be a secondary phenomenon coming from organized physical matter. Even consciousness comes from physical matter, from the brain. Hahnemann is telling us the exact opposite. Disease is not physically caused, does not have a material transmission, is not a physical lesion or physical changes. Any physical changes are the observed outcome of the mistunement, what's observed downstream. If disease then is not a physical condition, what do we make of the physical changes that we've been calling the disease? They are the effect of the disease, the visible expression of it, and not the disease itself. <clears throat> this view that Hahnemann gives us is that there is first the disorder at the non-physical conscious level, what he calls mistunement of the life force is what we are to pay attention to. <clears throat> the detailed physical changes that medicine now focuses, focuses on, you know, allopathic conventional medicine today, with various instruments, are of little significance. The pathology that they detect is not the disease. So they're looking at something that is irrelevant. Let's look for a moment at what Kent says about it, because he is one of those that really understood Hahnemann's teaching. And he put much of this in his writing, which is very useful to us, because he uses somewhat different words than Hahnemann, which can make it more clear to us sometimes. Here from his writing is what we're exploring here. Kent says, each and everything that appears before the eyes is but the representative of its cause. And there is no cause except in the interior. Causes exist in such subtle form <clears throat> that they cannot be seen by the eye. There is no disease that exists of which the cause is known to man by the eye or by the microscope. And, and we can extend that to any of the other devices that are used to try to see things that are small. Causes are infinitely too fine to be observed by any instrument of precision. They are so immaterial that they correspond to and operate upon the interior nature of man. And they are ultimated in the body in the form of tissue changes that are recognized by the eye. The changes we recognize, the outcome of disease. Such tissue changes must be understood as a result of disease only, or the physician will never perceive what disease cause is, what disease is, what potentialization is, or what the nature of life is. The more the disease ultimates itself in the outward form, the coarser it is, and the less it points the physician to the remedy. Interesting. <clears throat> The homeopathic view, is it not clear Hahnemann's understanding that the physical world is not the primary reality, that we come from a spiritual dimension? What follows from this is that disease does not originate on the physical level, but is happening only on the non-physical dimension. From there, that level, it manifests itself in observable changes in function, new sensations, emotional and mental alterations. The physical location is significant, as also the functional changes, such as becoming hot, full, and painful, are a guide. But the resultant pathology, the final outcome of disease, is not in itself of any significance. What we recognize as the signs of disease are the outcome of disease, what Kent's called the ultimates, and they are not the disease itself. 
What about microorganisms? This is a common question. Well, what about germs and viruses and so on? <clears throat> in the glossary, in the definition of disease, Hahnemann clearly indicates that diseases and also medicines affect the condition of the human organism only by acting dynamically upon the life force. He says the basin of the disease dynamically interacts, impinges upon, and alters the attunement of the dynamis, the human basin. In other words, the disease itself has an essence, it has an identity, it's a living thing. And its contact with the human basin causes a disturbance. In other words, the basin of the disease acts on the dynamic level instantaneously, in the wake of which there is a material manifestation of the disease, which is associated with the reproduction and growth of microorganisms. So again, from what we said earlier, the growth of microorganisms is what occurs as an effect of disease. They are not the disease itself. Ken explains this well. <clears throat> he describes observable changes in our patient as the second state following the first one, disordered, the mistunement. This deals with the outermost, it relates to externals. You have to consider both the internal and external man. That is, you have to consider causes that operate in this disordered innermost. And then the ultimates, which constitute the outward appearance, particularly when the affection is chronic. These two things must be considered, the nature or essence of the disease and its appearance. The more the disease ultimates itself in the outward form, the coarser it is and the less it points the physician to the remedy. So the more it develops physically, the less it is a guide to what the disease actually is. Now here's an example case. This is a case of blindness in a dog. <clears throat> Not my case, it's from the literature. Recently, I made a fine cure in a magnificent Newfoundland dog a friend possesses such a dog and is fairly crazy about him. About four weeks ago, I visited him and found him quite despondent. His favorite Pluto had become blind. I examined the dog and I find a dense white covering over both eyes. He was stone blind. On inquiry, I'm told that Pluto had a festering sore in his head, which was very much inflamed for several days. Presently, the eyes became inflamed also and the animal became blind in both eyes. I comforted the owner, assuring him that his dog would regain the eyesight inside of a week. I ordered to be administered once every two hours, two drops of the first dilution, and I put in here presumably one C, of cannabis sativa in a teaspoonful of water, and at the same time, drop a few drops of this mixture between the separated eyelids every two hours. <clears throat> On the third day, the dog commenced to see. For although the eyes still looked opaque, he walked everywhere. In five days more, the eyes were as clear as ever, not a trace of opacity remaining. As Pluto was well known and favored personality in the whole town, this astonishing cure created much surprise. And you can see down here at the bottom is where it's from, the homeopathic recorder, uh, 1890. And here's the doctor that did the report. This is a typical case. We're presented with a condition, observable signs, yet no laboratory data, you notice? It's only in what's reported here is only what can be observed with one's senses. Granted, this was 1890, though not likely this is even an option. There are implications of infection with the fistulous eruption being the start. Would not the veterinarian of today want to run blood tests, perhaps a culture? Though actually they don't do cultures much anymore these days, but it used to be so. The doctor of that time works with what was, a, what was perceptible to him. 
and was able to resolve it without any more information being needed. That's the important point here. How would we work it? Not much to go on. Primarily the eye condition, which is extreme, therefore of much importance. There's also the skin eruption that produced pus. So I did this little analysis just as an exercise. So you can see I put in opacity or cloudiness of the cornea, and I also put in the, another rubric film over the eyes just to make sure we covered it. And cannabis does come up here, you know, right at the top. So it, it, I guess it's not surprising then, but um, you can see that analysis would give us other choices. There's no evidence that the doctor did an analysis. Rather, we can assume he already knew the remedy because in those days they studied the remedy, studied Materia Medica. They didn't really use repertories much. I don't even know for sure they existed much. <clears throat> for cannabis sativa, herring has in uh, guiding symptoms, cornea becomes obscured with a film before the eyes. And Allen's encyclopedia contains the same sentence. I also confirmed that cannabis sativa does have skin eruptions like seeing this dog. Herring, for example, the set describes mattery eruptions and eruptions which are pustular. So the remedy really does fit this, and this doctor knew it. So what is needed to work a case? Going beyond the details, do we see that we're able to cure conditions like this by using what is visible to us? Is that enough? Would we do better to use laboratory tests, microscopes, and so on? Is that necessary to cure? Hahnemann tells us in aphorism 14, <clears throat> there is nothing curably diseased, nor any curable invisible disease alteration in the human interior that by disease, disease signs and symptoms would not present itself to the exactly observing physician for discernment, quite in keeping with the infinite goodness of the all wise life sustainer of humanity. So he's saying that's the way it's provided to us. That's all that we need to do is be careful, exact observe observations. He's making the statement, the information we need to cure our patient will be available to us. We must discern it. The dictionary tells us that the word discern means to perceive or recognize something. As well, Hahnemann is saying this is an expression of goodness, presumably a divine action, that we're able to see that. So observing the patient, Hahnemann in this extract tells us what we need can be readily sensed by the practitioner. In this uh, aphorism six, the medical art practitioner can never see the spiritual vase in the life force that creates a disease, and he never needs to see it. In order to cure, he only needs to see and experience its diseased effects. Therefore, in the eyes of the medical art practitioner, it is not that which reveals itself to the senses by disease signs, the disease itself. What else is the old school looking for in the hidden interior of the organism as a prima causa morbi while at the same time rejecting and utterly disdaining the disease presentation that's clearly perceptible to the senses. That is the symptoms that audibly speak to us. What else do they want to cure disease but those symptoms? It's an interesting statement from Hahnemann because you know today now, I think we can say that doctors really very rarely even look at their patients anymore. They turn to all these tests and things and rarely do a physical exam or careful observation. So symptoms are what we have to observe to, um, to do homeopathic work, not pathology. In the medicine of experience, uh, a writing of Hahnemann, he says, the internal essential nature of every malady, of every individual ca case of disease, as far as it is necessary for us to know it, for the purpose of curing it, this expresses itself by the symptoms as they present themselves to the investigations of the true observer in their whole extent, connection, and succession. 
When the physician has discovered all the observable symptoms of the disease that exist, he has discovered the disease itself by that observation. He has attained the complete conception of, its requis its re of it requisite to enable him to effect a cure. That's what's needed. So let's look at another case as an example. <laughs> um, this is a one from Kent's writings, uh, has minor writings. He gives this case here, which is a lady 65 years of age, consulted, he says, consulted me for proxidentia, which is, I looked it up, I didn't know the word, it means uterine prolapse. And she was compelled to wear a tea bandage wherever she walked. <coughs> Lying down gave her some relief. <clears throat> Bloody watery leucorrhea, which was offensive. She was greatly emaciated, waxy, bloodless, scrawny, skin very dry and shriveled, toes becoming dark with gangrenous patches. Occasional attacks of bloody diarrhea, great weakness, believed herself near the end, had suffered from this extreme displacement for more than 20 years. Had on numerous occasions attempted to wear mechanical support, always failing because of the soreness of the parts. <clears throat> See Kaylee cured in a very short time, and the woman has gained flesh, strength, and color, and is in excellent spirits. Kent says, in such instances, if cure can be performed where mechanical support cannot be tolerated, why not in cases most suitable to mechanical contrivances? This remedy would be seldom thought of by routinists for displacement, but it corresponded to the peculiarities of the patient. So what he means here is that he used the keynote or characteristic of Sikeli. And it's not a remedy we often think of for, for this particular condition. And here you see in the uh, rubrics that I copied here, in extremities gang gangrene of the toes, the lower extremities dropping off of the toes. In both of them, you see cicale is present. In the first rubric, it's the highest grade. In the second rubric, it's the only remedy. So that's what, that's what told him what to use. That was the keynote that he observed with his eyes. I did an exercise just to see what I could come up with. <clears throat> and um, I, I'm sure Ken didn't do one. I just did it to see what would happen. So I put in as many things as I could think of for the case. And you see how Sikeli is there uh, at the top as the first remedy. So the, it certainly, doing it that way certainly corresponded to what he observed using the keynote. Here's another case where a remedy was administered that would seldom be thought of if aimed at pro prolapsis as follows. A tall woman suffered many years from extreme prolapse, great bearing down on the pelvis. When at stool, numerous hemorrhoidal tumors were produced, produced, protruded, <clears throat> which seemed full of sticking pains, much burning and often attended with hemorrhage. Extreme pain, aching, bruised through the sacrum and hips when walking, pain extending down the thigh, the only comfortable position was lying in bed. Aeschylus cured this patient promptly. When she appeared for treatment, she wore a horseshoe pessary, which was removed in the usual manner by the patient, and the symptoms of the prolapse were permitted to appear, I guess, so he could observe it and look at it. Well, here I tried again to do it. It didn't work out quite so well for me. You see, uh, Aeschylus is over here, <laughs> way down the list. Um, and I tried to use as many of the uh, symptoms as I could that he lists there. So that's interesting, isn't it? Because he didn't go by an analysis like this, of course. So how did he recognize it? This is a good demonstration of direct remedy recognition without analysis. And it emphasizes to us the study of remedies. 
From Guernsey's keynotes to the Materia Medica, as an example, quote, the guiding thread directing the use of this remedy, Aeschylus, is found in the rectum, hemorrhoidal vessels, sacrum and back, affecting something affecting the sacrum and back. In the sacroiliac symphysis region is found the painful weariness brought on by exercise, relieved by rest, moving about causes the back to give out and then unfits one for business. And so that describes this case. Lippi's keynotes and red line symptoms, it says, with uterine troubles, constant backache across the hips and sacrum, aggravated by walking or stooping. So that's a very good fit. So you see it's that the, the concomitant here, the two together, uterine troubles and the backache together is the keynote. And that's what guided Ken. He knew this remedy. And so he recognized it just from observing the patient. So summation. What we have demonstrated here is confirmation of Hahnemann's advice <clears throat> that it's direct observation of the patient is all we need to find the needed treatment. In these cases, there were no other methods you mentioned, no lab tests, no x-rays, no turning to specialists. <clears throat> I suggest to you that the homeopathic method is this simple. Hahnemann actually simplified medicine. We carefully observe the patient. We recognize their pattern of mistreatment and then give them the appropriate remedy. That's it. There's nothing more to it than that. What then would change in medicine if we did this? What if homeopathic medicine was practiced according to the instructions of Hahnemann based on the principles and we gently discarded all the things not necessary, looking at pathology and so on. What changes would occur in conventional medicine? Well, one thing is we don't emphasize the use of laboratory tests or x-ray and things like that. Actually, our experience is that these tests are, are irrelevant. One no longer tries to remove the physical expression or make it go away with some drug treatment or surgery that acts only on a physical level, because the, well, now we know that the disease is not there on the physical level, and we wouldn't be dealing with it. We understand that if one were able to remove the physical, ex physical expression of the mistunement, that the disease continues on the level of the life force and has not been eliminated. We now understand that we block the physical expression with drugs or surgery or whatever, that the disease continues and will reorganize itself and we'll see it again in some form. Realizing that observable symptoms are the outcome, not the disease itself, we no longer consider disease to be physically communicated. The germ theory is put aside. Surgery is greatly reduced to a very small fraction of emergency procedures. The administration of drugs will stop. Allopathic pharmacies will be shut down. The use of diagnosis as a way to identify disease will be discontinued. And vaccinations as well will be discontinued. There will no longer be medical specialties as a patient is always one whole being and cannot be fragmented. Wait a minute. There's much of value in medicine, this wonderful technology that gives us the ability to analyze the various body fluids, x-ray, C-scan, let us look into the interior of the body and identify lesions. We can't foolishly put all that aside. Are these things necessary? If our criteria is what will bring about cure rather than non-curative methods of palliation and suppression, then do these new technologies give us useful information? Good question, isn't it? Would Hahnemann use them if he lived today? Aphorism 14. 
There is nothing curably diseased, nor any curable invisible disease alteration in the human interior that by disease signs and symptoms would not present itself to the exactly observing physician for discernment. Quite in keeping with the infinite goodness of the all wise life sustainer of humanity. So here it is, clear as could be. And footnote 12, the medical art practitioner can derive no benefit from probing into how and why the life force brings the organism to the manifestations of disease. That is how it creates disease. This will remain eternally hidden from him. The Lord of life laid before his senses only what was necessary and fully sufficient for him to be aware of our curative purposes. Again, as clear as it could be. <clears throat> Aphorism 18. It's an undeniable truth that nothing can by any means be discovered in diseases whereby they could express the need for aid besides the totality of symptoms. <clears throat> With consideration for the accompanying circumstances. Therefore, it follows incontestably that the complex of all the symptoms and circumstances perceived in each individual case of disease must be the only indicator, the only reference in choosing a remedy. Comment. Hahnemann makes clear that all we need to cure a patient is available to our senses. Nothing more is needed. No modern technology is required or of use. Conclusion. As we've gone through this, it is very clear that Hanum is establishing basic principles for us. We are spiritual beings, the body being an instrument we use. The origin of what we consider disease always starts on the non-physical level as a distortion of the life force, the dynamic influence or energy that manifests and maintains the body organism. What we're able to sense by careful observation are the changes that result from the mistuned life force action. They are not the disease per se. What we can observe is sufficient to guide us to cure. No further hidden information is needed. As we have already discussed, this would result in a major reformation of medicine. And much of what we now consider medicine would be discarded. And the only way this could be accepted by our consciousness <clears throat> is if we came to see, we come to see that the methods of modern medicine are not restoring health. As well, the commitment to aphorism one of the organism, the physician's highest and only calling is to make the sick healthy to cure. <clears throat> so that's it. Richard, that was awesome as, as always. Thanks so much. Um, so Sue, Judy, Henrietta, um, you're unmuted. If you want to comment or ask Richard any questions or we can actually go by and let me go look now. Nobody has their hand up, um, but I can. It was either, either it was either totally boring or or it was too clear. No, no, not not boring at all. And yeah, yeah, um, definitely, definitely very clear. Any, it does seem clear, comments? doesn't it? it? Seems like Hahnemann makes it as clear as possibly could be made. Yeah, but unfortunately, what you've described and what Hahnemann describes is the ultimate of what our medical system should be. Yes. But I don't think there's any way we're going to get there from where we are right now. Doesn't look like it, does it? Not, not, not the way that we, you know, yeah. Yeah, I understand. I wasn't suggesting that this is going to happen at least not that we can foresee but i was just exploring what would it be like you know how would medicine really change as, as just a mental exercise awesome awesome 
And Todd had a comment or question. Todd, you can hear us? <clears throat> yes, can you? Yep. Hello, hello everybody. Thanks, Richard. Really appreciate Bye. that. Excellent, uh, excellent thoughts, excellent presentation. Um, okay, we should put an application to replace some of the people that are in the highest levels of government right now. <laughs> give them a remedy. <laughs> give them a remedy, yes. What would the remedy be? High colonic. <laughs> High colonic. <laughs> okay, well, I appreciate it. It was uh, very well said. Good reminders of important truth. Yeah, and it also helps us maybe to realize that we don't have to hold on to some of the baggage we learned, you know, some of it's really not necessary. It's hard to let go of some of it, um, yeah. so. especially, if, you know, for, well, I feel like for someone like me who practiced for about 20 years conventionally, I, I still find it hard to break my mind free sometimes, right. but it, it has gotten easier over the years. <laughs> <laughs> good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again. Good to, yeah, good to hear from you. Yes. <clears throat> and Kieran had a comment and question in that exact vein. Karen, you're unmuted. Do you want to say it? Karen? Oops, are you there? Yep. Yep. Thank hey. you. Yeah, uh, thank you too, Richard. Richard, um, I was just wondering about if we're using physical observable changes to see what the vital force has done. Something like an X-ray does help us find a different change. Like I've had a patient that was missing a rib, and I wouldn't have known that without the X-ray. So I'm just curious about what you think about something like that some technology that does help us see other physical manifestations that would be abnormal. <clears throat> yes, I understand. It would show us things that we couldn't see or learn otherwise. <laughs> but the question is, how much value is it? <clears throat> if our purpose is to cure, and as Hahnemann says, to be very exacting in how we wa watch and discern our patient, uh, let's say we, we work out all that we can observe and and uh, and note either with our senses or by communication if it's a person communicating things to us as well what they've observed or sensations that they feel for example then what what why do we need to know then say whether there's a missing rib or why, why do we need to know if the blood test shows some imbalance you know it's like yes it's more information but does it change anything? Does it change our prescription? Uh, it's certainly not going to be something found in the provings. I guess you could say what one one case you could make for it. You say, well, it gives me more of information I could use in terms of prognosis. Because if you see, for example, that there's an organ's very damaged, you think you could say to the client, I don't think it's going to repair or something, you know. So you could use it for prognosis, but it's not going to help us find a remedy. Even something like maybe a, a kidney stone or bladder stone or something that you maybe couldn't feel with your hand or obviously you couldn't see them urinating them out or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. That if 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 you didn't see it in the urine, then I guess that's one way to identify it's a stone. But again, that may not. I have I hadn't worked a case like that. I don't know how you would do so if, if you put in a rubric for that actually says kidney stone. Probably there is one. But I imagine that there will be other parts of the case you'd want to focus on. But I understand you made a good point. And lots a lot of thanks and a few questions about where they can grab the, the recording of today and that'll be on the AVH um, YouTube channel. As long as Richard, you're okay with that, and as long as you sure. think I'll stay there. And thanks to Rosemary's son, 
put that together and actually Rosemary had a question or comment. So Rosemary, do you wanna uh, say whatever it is that you're writing? Okay, uh, hi Richard, hi Jeff. Hi Rosemary. Um, so I had, I just wanted to say, I agree completely with everything. I thought it was a great talk. Um, I did have this puppy that was limping cause it fell out of the son's arms and his knee had a slight draw sign. So I thought it was his knee cause he wasn't, he was holding it up. But, uh, I really wanted to know if it was fractured just, you know, in case, cause I would treat the knee or am I fractured? So I x-rayed and he did have a fracture of the tibia, but it was straight down spiral. Everything was still together. Didn't even need a cast. And I just treated him for the fracture and it healed. And I think that the draw sign was part of being a puppy growing fast, skinny dog, just loose ligaments. So I'm thinking, well, I would have gone more in a joint sense than rather than a fracture sense with my remedies. So I, I thought maybe that was, I agree with, um, I can't remember who spoke before, that the no. x-ray was helpful. Yeah, I understand. Uh, that's an interesting exercise, which you might do, <clears throat> assuming that you were able to treat successfully, you could go back to the case and look at the remedy that was used and see if you could have recognized that remedy with what you observed without knowing if there was a fracture or not. You follow me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I used and fight him and he, he did walk in 10 days, no problem. He put weight, he has full weight on it. I think it was two weeks later, they were just in. Yeah. You know, so it was in the knee, even though the knee was loose, but I agree. What does symphytum have in it? You know, that maybe has the looseness of the ligaments. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. This is the way of studying it and looking at it at different angles. Yeah. No, great. I, I, I'm not, I know, I'm not saying you shouldn't use those things. I'm trying to paint a picture of what medicine would be like if we used homeopathy, the principles of homeopathy as our guide that we wouldn't be focusing so much on those on tests like that mm -hmm. lab test actually not that we wouldn't use them necessarily like you pointed mm -hmm. out that that could give us some information but the thing is right now today everything's turned to emphasizing the tests and and devices mm -hmm. and technology instead of looking at the patient no so i agree i have to talk people out of doing lab mm -hmm. tests because i tell them it's not going to help us right. because we're using and they don't have to spend two hundred forty dollars, you know. Like, you could do this. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And just one step up after what Rosemary said. Um, it may not help us prescribing was, but it does help a lot of owners, you know, uh, get a name, get a quote unquote diagnosis, but yeah, then we want to work, go beyond that. And yeah, I mean, uh, but how do we educate them, Richard, which does seem to be the key is educating people that what the regular vets are telling them or what MDs are telling them is only a piece of oh. what's really going on. Well, it's it. yeah, it's the it's not an easy thing to address as you're suggesting now, because it, there's a whole context. Uh, there's a movement and consciousness of of the consciousness that underlies medical practice, which is first of all materialism, as I said, and secondly more and more towards uh, technology and various devices and so that we've been discussing. And so to point out to somebody, you know, that that's not as important as you think it is. And they'll really, uh, what, what is of them, the um, maximum importance is for you to carefully examine your patient physically and by interview or an observation. And that's the way medicine used to be done, you know, a century ago or more. 
but they would say, well, why do that? We have so many, you know, we have all these advances now and we now can see what, you know, what, what the disease is that's there, you know, we can recognize it because they're looking at it materially. So it would take a, career, a, a shift of consciousness. That's the, that's the, the, the challenge mm -hmm. of the obstacle. I think that's huge, huge, Richard. It's Susan Beale. That that whole shifting consciousness thing is is gigantic. And the thing that I see happening in in medicine more and more and more. I mean, it's even even the basic stuff that we were trained with as actually like how to do an actual physical exam and and those kinds of stuff has fallen by the wayside. And right. and also the big thing that's happening in medicine now, both in veterinary medicine and on the human side, is they're making more and more and more and more uh, artificial intelligence input to, to medicine. So the radiographs are read that way. Uh, my housemate here is works for a company where they're trying to train a computer to read histo slides and 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 those sorts of things. And and so it it divorces us even more than generally. Uh, you know, re reductionist medicine has divorced from from vitalism. You know, and as we mm -hmm. get more and more and more down that trail, um, it it changes the energetic dynamics of it, and it also has m more of us are dinosaurs because we actually use um, empirical perception type medicine as opposed to let's run it through the lab. So I think I just thank you for this. Um, it, this this whole conversation has been really up in a lot of in a lot of um, places that I've been turning lately, and and it's just really sweet to 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 get it reinforced. Good, thank you, thank you, Susan. It's a good way to put it. Yes, only Quintes, always Susan. Um, Chaletta, do you want to say anything before we go? I had a couple of comments in the chat. Oh. I should be able to see that, shouldn't I? Um, am I unmuted now? You, you are, yep, yep, you're great. Yeah, no, my, my big comment really at the end, um, just because, you know, I know Richard in many of our conferences, you've talked about how even the allopathic system is like, has its own life force and or a disease, it's a mistunement, but it's like, wow, it's it's really gotten out of, out of tune now with everything that's going on. It's just no. the way they're trying to mandate this and mandate and force, force this belief no. and no. putting everything. It is. It's a good example of what. It's a good example of the consciousness underlying the modern mm. view, mm. isn't it? See how mm. disordered it is. How illogical. Mm -hmm. Mostly dominated by fear. Well, yeah, yeah, and that's interesting. Hahnemann didn't talk about. Fear. <laughs> well, he, does, he, he doesn't. He doesn't talk about that way. But if you read the organon about how disease happens, he talks about the life force encountering an inimical potence. He says, in other words, on the level of consciousness, sure, what we are as a as an as a spiritual being perceives, or maybe that's not the word, somehow senses that there's something there that could be dangerous. Right. So, and that creates fear. Because you know, if you didn't have fear when it's encountered, then there's no mistunement, right? The mistunement is yeah. a reaction. So, like yeah. for example, if you're not if you're not at all afraid of, of uh, COVID, or you're not afraid of of, of um, certain foods or whatever, you know, you could go in and have no problem being in, in contact with these things, whereas somebody else may be having a lot of trouble with it. You see because it depends on their susceptibility, whether or not they're afraid of it. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of that fear that's just running rampant with people yeah. now in, in all their decisions and choices and <laughs> when they're trying to push their choice on others. Right, exactly. Unreal. Mm -hmm. it, Richard, it reminds me, Joel Shepard was talking at the Illinois meeting a couple of weeks ago about just how do we have conversations to, to try and communicate between both of these sort of somewhat isolated islands. And, and was 
just talking about the whole the the, the different roots of science for example you know the the Sierra science which is to know by splitting and reducing and the scientia science which is to, to know as an expert and by experiential kinds of kinds of things and then also reminding reminding us about you know that whole that whole way that the in the in the original German talking about the difference between the the corpor the the physical body and and the lead which is like the livingness body and and talking about um, organs and things as instruments of systems rather than the system and it, it was it just you know to listen to to, to that um, I say philosophical meandering quite lovingly, actually. And then to listen to what you said tonight and put that together, if, if we could get our heads out of our butts, you know, we could re revolutionize the whole way of being. It, it's really, it's really, uh, it's really sweet. Yeah, good. Thank you. And Bob has his hand raised. Bob Albrecht, you want to speak? Can we hear you? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> sure. Um, just on the subject of of uh, materialism and and uh, the assumption of modern science that our consciousness arises from the material. I'm halfway through reading a book that speaks to this that you might be interested in. Just to share it, it's called Infinite Awareness: The Awakening of a Scientific Mind by Marjorie Hines Woolacott. Um, so if any, I, they, she, uh, she brings in some really good evidence, arguments uh, that consciousness has nothing to do with the, the material, with the brain. Yeah, um, yeah. there's good <laughs> evidence for that, a lot of evidence that that's so. Yeah. That'd be an interesting topic in itself, wouldn't it? Indeed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So, any other questions or comments? Well, thanks, everybody. I oh, hope you I, enjoyed it. Got something out of it. I I just wrote in one last question. The and I can't pronounce the S S Q list if I'm pr pronouncing that right. Which remedy was that? There's um, glabra and hippocastinum in the uh, in Herring's ten volume guiding. I'm just curious. Do you know? I don't think I understood what you said there. Of course, just not. The, there was two. There's two. Asculus remedies that in that one case that you presented where oh. Asculus was the remedy. Do you know which one it was? There's no, no, I didn't know there were two. Yeah, I just noticed it in Herring's 10 volume guide. No, I guess you'd have to read it. Yeah. Which I the, think one it's is actually, the one is a high Ohio Buckeye. That's interesting. Oh, I, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> right. Thank you, Richard. It's been oh, yeah. awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you all yeah, for thank coming. You. And we'll see you next month. Okay. <laughs>